Major funding for the 2002 University of Washington Science Forum, Exploring Our World Large and Small, is brought to you by the University of Washington, Office of the Provost, College of Arts and Sciences, College of Engineering, School of Medicine, and the UW Alumni Association. With major funding from WRF Capital, the 2002 UW Science Forum is part of WRF Capital's 20th Anniversary Celebration Series. Additional support is provided by University Bookstore, Millstone Coffee, Dilettante Chocolates, and the University Inn. Thank you. I'd like to take just a quick moment to thank our sponsors who have helped to make this possible. Uh, WRF Capital certainly is at the top of that list. This is their 20th anniversary, and to celebrate this in this way, it's just a wonderful thing for them. The University Bookstore, and we have books related to tonight's lectures available up on the second floor afterwards. Millstone Coffee, producing, uh, providing coffee in the reception afterwards as Dilettante Chocolates is providing biscotti and University N will provide information as well upstairs, and they have been a sponsor of this, this series. So we're very grateful for the partnerships uh, and the investments that these folks have made in us. But on to tonight. Tonight's lecture, with the rather inspiring title, The Ends of the World as We Know It, Astrobiology to Armageddon. This is by Don Brownlee and Peter Ward, two researchers who work in very different discipline but whose collaborations are key to expanding knowledge in the emerging field of astrobiology. Many of you, most of you perhaps, are unfamiliar with this term as it is virtually a brand new science. The astrobiology program at the University of Washington is a new graduate certificate program that embodies the value of cross-disciplinary research and teaching. Eleven departments from across campus participate in this um, innovative program, training PhD students to study life in extreme environments, both on the earth and beyond. And ours was the very first doctoral program in the nation specifically geared to train scientists to search for life elsewhere. In tonight's lecture, we hear from two of our most creative and innovative scientists, one who studies the earthly world and one who studies the other worlds. They will share with us their research and theories about the Earth's evolutionary processes and what they can teach us about the possibility of life on other planets and whether or not Earth might continue to sustain life, at least as we know it. Don Brownlee and Peter Ward are co-authors of a new book, Rare Earth, Why Complex Life is Uncommon in the Universe. Don Brownlee himself is a professor of astronomy. He got his doctorate at the University of Washington. He investigates interplanetary dust, comets, meteorites, and the origin of the solar system through research conducted not only at the University of Washington, but as with most of our faculty elsewhere, including the Lunar Science Institute and the California Institute of Technology. He's the principal investigator for NASA's seven-year Stardust mis Discovery mission that is hoping to collect comet samples and return them to the Earth. Uh, very distinguished. Uh, career to say the least. Equally distinguished is Peter Ward, professor of Earth and Space Sciences and adjunct professor of astronomy and zoology. Peter explores the formation of species today as compared to ancient processes of species formation and extinction. He leads a team that recently received research grant from NASA to study, among other things, how, where, and how often habitable planets may be formed and he has just been asked by NASA to become part of the next Mars mission planning group. Finally, Peter gave, and this is a very nice point of distinction, the first ever lecture by a scientist at the Solomon Guggenheim Museum of Art in New York City just last week. So I think you get a sense of the extraordinary careers of, of these two faculty, and so it's with great pleasure that I invite Don Brownlee and Peter Ward to the podium. Thank you.
we're going to talk about the uh, long distance future of our planet. Uh, I'm going to start out talking about some of the physical aspects of our future evolution. And Peter will start talking about the biological uh, aspects in about 20 minutes or so. This is a project that uh, we've been involved in, sort of a dual kind of project uh, based on books. The first book was Rare Earth, which we published two years ago. And this is about the Earth in space, and the, the fact that the Earth is a special place in space, and that it has a rather special ability to provide an environment where animals and advanced plants can thrive. And uh, now we're working on this new project called the Ends of the Earth, which is looking at the Earth not in terms of space, but in terms of time. The Earth as we know it now, how does it compare with the Earth in the future? This is kind of an intriguing uh, activity because actually very few people have seriously thought about the far distant history of the Earth. Everyone says this is the end of the world, but they're usually referring to some really short time thing, not a long time. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about the Earth in space. Uh, these are, as an astronomer, I love planets. These are three fabulous uh, planets from an astronomer's standpoint. But from people's standpoint, you know, it's something else. And this was the basis, <laughs> this, this was the basis of, our, of our first book. Earth is, uh, you know, the pale blue planet. It's a pretty nice place. Mars, for all the good things you hear about it, is actually a bad place. It's uh, better than worst over here, but it's 50% further from the sun. It's pretty puny. Uh, it is, has a very thin atmosphere. And it's so cold in the poles in the wintertime that carbon dioxide freezes out as dry ice on the poles. Worst is the real estate over here, which is Venus. Venus is hot enough on its surface to melt lead and tin. It actually glows uh, a little bit. The surface of the entire planet was covered with lava about four or 500 million years ago. These are our closest neighbors in space. Venus is very similar to Earth except it's 30% closer to the sun. These are really nasty places uh, for life. So the Earth is a very nice place. The, uh, now in terms of the Earth in time, this is a diagram you probably haven't seen or thought about before. This is the Earth history. The Earth and sun will last 12 billion years. So we can put this on a, a clock that goes from zero to 12. And the Earth history in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a capsule, at least from an astrobiology viewpoint, the first life began about here, uh, which is just after the period of heavy bombardment when the last huge cratering impacts uh, occurred. Oxygen started in the atmosphere about 2.2 billion years after the beginning. But it took 4 billion years of physical and biological evolution on this planet to get from the little microbes that first formed here to get to us, to get the animals. And that's a long time. That, that was one of the ideas behind rare earths. It's easy to get the first life, but it takes a long time to uh, get to animals, at least for, for, our, for our planet. Venus never had a chance. Mars, we, we don't know about. Anyway, we are right here, 4.56 billion years after the beginning. And this green patch in here is the age of plants and animals. That's when the environment provides when the Earth provides an environment that's suitable for the you know, survival of plants and animals that we know. And we'll talk about what happens at 5 o'clock uh, during this talk, but this is the end of the age of plants and animals. This is the, actually the end of plants and also vegetarians. <laughs> uh, and then there are interesting other things that occur uh, around in here, ocean loss to space. And then up here at noon, uh, the Earth goes into the sun, and it's all over. Um, but when you, when you look at this clock, uh, you can think of it in sort of an astrobiology uh, standpoint. When we look out in space, we're looking for other Earths. But what is Earth? We always think of Earth right here, where we live right now in time. But the Earth now is quite different than it was early in here. And it's certainly quite different than it will be in future time. Uh, we don't know about the future, but you certainly wouldn't have been, none of us in this room would have been very happy living almost any time in the past, even the near past, let alone uh, the distant past. And to put this in a perspective, you, you could think of talking about Seattle. This is where this 
program is being uh, filmed. Uh, what is Seattle like? So you can ask yourself the question, what is Seattle? Well, people ask a person on the street, they say Seattle is a place with lots of people, with cars, and restaurants, coffee shops, uh, home of the Mariners, all kinds of neat things, you know. Well, that's Seattle, right? Well, if you asked the question 200 years ago, the answer would have been Seattle. Oh, big trees, lots of salmon, acres of clams. It's a great place in that you're not very often raided by, by nearby civilizations. If you asked the same question 20,000 years ago, the answer would be nothing. 20,000 years ago, there were thousands of feet of ice on top of this very spot. If you heard anything, it might be the grumble of a mastodon off, off in the distance. So we're completely covered with ice. So what is Seattle? Well, it depends on when you ask the question. What is the Earth like? It depends on when you ask the question. So the end of this story is not a happy one. Uh, I guess since Millstone is our sponsor, maybe I should have put Millstone coffee cups here. But uh, <laughs> uh, at least I hope you appreciate the, uh, the Seattle paraphernalia up here. Anyway, uh, I have to warn people that this is not a happy story. It's a depressing story. But you're not allowed to leave this thing depressed. This, none of what we talk about affects us, except maybe intellectually. It doesn't affect us physically, because we're talking about things that are happening billions of years in the future. So as an analogy, I'd like to think of just the cycle of nature. And we talk about flowers. We all like flowers. Everybody likes flowers. So flowers start out as some little weird thing like, like this. And after a while, they turn into something really quite magnificent. But there's no doubt, you know, no one looks at a flower like this and says, oh my god, these are dying plants. Because we all know that in weeks, or a week, we're going to be here. <laughs> so when we look at the Earth as it is now and realize it's going to be worse in the far distant future, don't feel bad. Feel really happy that we happen to live on a really good place in the universe at a really good time. So, Appreciate the present, and don't dwell on, on the future, uh, <laughs> the distant future. OK, the future. We're talking about the future here. Can it be predicted? Well, of course it can't be predicted. It can, but it can't. Futurism is a very risky business. I'll give some examples here, famous examples. I said to my brother Orville, man would not fly for 50 years. Wilbur Wright, 1908. Who the hell wants to hear actors talk? Harry M. Warner of Warner Brothers, 1927. We don't like their sound. Groups of guitars are on the way out. Decca Records rejecting the Beatles in 1962. Man will never reach the moon, regardless of all future scientific advances. Lee DeForest, father of radio. So there are famous examples of how you cannot predict the future. And you can't predict the future in certain aspects. But the long-term future, you can. The actual pathway that the Earth will exactly follow in the future is, of course, unknown. But the final state of the Earth is understood just as well as you can predict the state of this unfortunate flower that I microwaved just before the uh, <laughs> talk. So how can the ends of the world uh, be predicted? Well, Peter is a paleontologist. I'm an astronomer. We deal with billions of years every day when, in, 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 in our work. And we also deal with things that are very far away in astrobiology. Our fields would not work if it wasn't for laws of nature that we can understand. So as scientists, we strongly believe the laws of nature are, in fact, universal. Astronomy couldn't possibly work. Our understanding of the universe couldn't work if these laws weren't universal. You'd never guess this from the media. But uh, these laws of nature have nothing to do with scientists. They are the way nature works. Newton may have discovered things, and Einstein may have discovered things, but he didn't invent them. He didn't make them up. This is just the way nature works. And so we can use these principles, 
that are discovered in labs and dropping bowling balls off of Pisa, Tower of Pisa and so forth, and extrapolate them to the far corners of the universe, if the universe had corners. Okay, the fundamental problem with the future of the Earth, and also the reason why we actually can predict many of its uh, futures, is the sun. And the sun here, it says, living with a nuclear reactor. It is a nuclear reactor. It's converting hydrogen to helium in its interior, and it can do it for over 10 billion years. It's good. The sun has been fabulous to us uh, in the past. It turns bad. And then in the end, it becomes almost unimag unimaginably ugly and beautiful at the same time. I'll, one of the last slides will show us the beautiful sun. But this, the bad and the ugly, causes us great problems and great stress on Earth's physical systems and its biological systems in the uh, coming years. Now, you know, science has only been around. Astronomy is the oldest science, uh, but it's still only been around a short period of time compared to the age of the universe. So how can we really think that we can understand how stars work? Well, we can observe many stars in all their different kinds of evolutionary forms. So here's an area where stars are born, and we can follow through them through at various evolutionary stages, and we can see their death. So the, you know, from observations and studies of astronomy and just simple physics, you can actually pretty much predict what stars will do in the future and how long they will last. I mean, some of it is just like, you know, if you have 10 gallons of gas in your car and you're going 60 miles an hour east, you could pretty well predict when you're going to run out of gas. The sun is a nuclear reactor. It has fuel. Eventually, it runs out of fuel. And that's what causes the problems uh, for Earth. Uh, unlike most engines uh, that usually get weaker with age, the sun actually gets stronger. What happens is the sun's... Uh, Peter will talk about the age of animals and these microbial ages uh, later. But uh, here's where we are now, four and a half billion years into the age of the solar system. And we start out here. And here the sun was about 30% fainter than it is right now. It's always been amazing that the sun, that the Earth has been as stable as it has, considering the sun has been slowly brightening in time. But you can see in, in, as time goes on, it gets brighter and brighter and brighter. When it goes off the chart, I'll show you a little bit later, it really goes off the uh, chart. But what's the cause of this increase in brightness? It's a very interesting and, at least in some ways, a simple process. The sun is a nuclear reactor. So this says hydrogen to helium. Imagine that this is the core of the sun. All the mass of the sun is surrounding it. And its gravity is pulling it in. And this little yellow balloon that says hydrogen to helium has to support the weight of all that overlaying matter. The pressure inside the balloon with this volume depends on just two things. How many particles are inside the balloon that I breathe in there and how, what the temperature is. Well, as the sun evolves in time, its reaction is turning hydrogen into helium which means the number of particles is decreasing in time. In the end, most of the core of the sun goes from hydrogen to almost pure helium, so the number of particles actually decreases by four. It takes four protons, four hydrogens, to make one helium. So if you reduce the number of particles in there and don't do anything else, what happens? You take particles out. I'll let some air out of this balloon, and you can guess what happens. It makes a noise, but it also gets smaller. <laughs> and yet we know the core doesn't get smaller because stars like the sun are reasonably stable, uniform outputters of energy. So if you want to make this balloon swell up to its original size to produce the pressure to hold up the overlying matter, you have to increase the temperature. And this is the reason that we have grim things uh, in the least coming billions of years. Because when the temperature of the core of the sun increases, the energy generation rate increases slowly. And that's why this curve ramps up and gets brighter and brighter with time. Now, I'll talk about two effects of, of this. Uh, one is on carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is actually our food. You know, we, we 
eat plants and we eat things that, that eat plants. It all comes from the atmosphere, CO2. Well, there's a cycle here where the weathering, rain, because we have water on the surface of the earth, and rocks, we have land, uh, removes carbon dioxide uh, from the atmosphere and forms carbonates out here, which in eventually become seashells on, on, on the ocean floor. There's a cycle here where it's returned through volcanoes and so forth. That's a, a wonderful thermostat that actually keeps this temperature of the Earth relatively stable. But the main thing is that the weathering takes this life-giving gas out of the atmosphere. You, CO2 has a bad name because of the greenhouse effect and global warming and so forth, but we really do depend on it. We like our plants. And uh, here's the long-term evolution of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. There is global warming at the end, an increase in CO2. But overall, the history of the Earth, uh, this carbon dioxide has decreased in time. This graph is from data from Bob Berner at Yale University. So we're actually forgetting about the local global warming down here. This is a log plot, so each tick is a factor of 10 in abundance of carbon dioxide. We're about the lowest carbon dioxide uh, we've had in the entire history of the planet. As the sun gets warmer, gets brighter, the removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere of going to carbonates gets more and more efficient. And this just drops down to zero on a, on a linear scale. And so in the coming years, within about a half a billion years or so, the carbon dioxide level will drop down below the point where plants can, can survive. So this is the end of the age of plants and vegetation vegetarians. Uh, <laughs> I said that later. Okay, so that, that's, the, that's the first coming problem, was the decline of CO2 dropping out of the atmosphere. Uh, then there's the ocean. We love the ocean. We were born in the ocean. We play in the, in the ocean. The ocean has been good to us, like the sun has been good to us, but in the future, it gets real bad. Life on Earth cannot survive on this planet in the distant future, any kind of life, unless we get rid of this ocean, wonderful as it is. Uh, so there are two fates uh, to the ocean. One is called the moist greenhouse effect, I'll describe shortly. It starts in about a billion years, and in this process, the ocean is lost to space, which sounds bad, but it's actually good, because we want to get rid of it for reasons I'll discuss shortly. So this is a lifesaver. It doesn't save our life, but it saves bacteria. If the moist greenhouse effect is, is successful in driving the ocean off into space, then it's possible that bacteria living on Earth will see the sun become a red giant star. It's amazing. If it doesn't, life may end on Earth uh, much earlier. The other possibility is called a runaway greenhouse effect. This is from water vapor in the atmosphere. It starts at about three and a half billion years, maybe somewhat more. And this is pretty bad. It actually melts the surface of the Earth. Just ponder that, melting the surface of the earth, the rocks. Imagine looking at Mount Rainier and starting to sort of puddle down and fill. And the whole earth turns to something like a billiard ball, a shiny billiard ball. Kills everything. OK, the greenhouse effect you hear a lot about, uh, and many people point out this is not really the way the greenhouse houses work, uh, which it isn't. But nonetheless, the idea is that sunlight comes in, infrared, heats up the ground, infrared radiation tries to get out, and it's absorbed by greenhouse gases, such as carbon dioxide and water vapor, or freon, if, you, if you've got it around. So this is kind of a messy slide, but it's uh, intriguing. This is uh, uh, an estimate of the future course of the surface temperature of the Earth versus time. Here's now, here's going on to the, 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 the future. Look, look first at the moon there. This is just to the brightening of the sun, the lunar surface just increases, you know, 25 or so degrees over this several billion year time span. But the Earth temperature goes really high, including above this deadline, higher the temperature than any known organism on Earth can survive. The most high temperature organism now can exist for 113 degrees. We'll give them a little leeway, say 150 degrees. But this is, this is bad. So the two ways the Earth could go is if it goes to the runaway greenhouse effect, you reach these degrees of hundreds and even 1,000 degrees C. If the moist greenhouse effect can get rid of things around here, uh, then the Earth may not go up above the deadline until it becomes uh, a red giant. So the moist greenhouse effect is a process 
where water vapor comes up from the surface through the atmosphere and evaporates into space. This is a picture of, of, of the Earth's atmosphere taken 135 feet above Texas. And uh, if you could watch water vapor come up the troposphere in here where all the clouds are, up to the stratosphere, and eventually leak out in space. You can actually observe this effect if you're in the right place. This is a picture taken of your Earth from the moon, from Apollo 16. It's a picture of the Earth. Here's the Earth in ultraviolet. The sun is off to the left, and this hideous glow here is your ocean going off into space. The ocean leaked up through the, the water vapor leaked up through the ocean, up to the atmosphere, got split into hydrogen and oxygen, and the hydrogen evaporates and actually fluoresces out here. The loss rate now is about one meter of ocean per billion years. But in the future, as the sun gets warmer, uh, this, this rate will increase. OK, the idea of losing oceans is not new. It's a famous study by Percival Lowell, the early part of last century of Mars. And he was intrigued by the concept that Mars actually may have had an ocean and was losing it. And I'll now back up that these little lines on here he thought were built by Martians trying to tap the remaining water supplies on this desert planet. Well, we will actually reach something like this in the, in the coming years. The, uh, Ocean will evaporate one way or the other, and it'll look something like uh, this. This is Death Valley, famous bad water. And towards the end, the, our planet, which was the pale blue planet, beautiful blue planet, will actually turn pink. As the water goes down, uh, uh, sulfur, I mean, uh, salt loving organisms uh, called halophiles will bloom. And the buildup of oxygen in the atmosphere will cause the surface to rust and will turn the color of these salt ponds in San Francisco Bay sometime in the distant future, billions of years from now. Okay, I think I'll pass the talk to Peter. Nice job. Well, there's a hard act to follow. I went to Don yesterday and I said, Don, I want to go down to the costume store and get a chicken suit. Chicken little, right? This guy's fallen. And he said, Peter, you can't do that. Well, then, okay, I didn't do that. And he comes with all these props. And the second thing is, <laughs> I love giving these talks, but I can't stay still. And the UW TV people said, if you move off this podium, you will die. <laughs> we have an electric shocker that will take care of you. So I have to be on my best behavior and be shackled to this point. So all this nasty stuff that Don has talked about is clearly going to be affecting and noticed by the biota. We live on this beautiful planet. And one of the questions we like to know is if the conditions that keep life, such as you and me, alive on this planet are the same conditions that allowed life as we know it to arise. We are like mad doctors, in a sense, doctors of planetary health. And the point of view to me is that, although I hate to admit this to this audience, but I will, is that I've reached middle age. <laughs> I've noticed that when one goes to the doctor in middle age, there's a whole new sense of what's going on there. Now, when you're a kid, they're going to tell you, you're going to grow up big and strong, you're going to be so tall, you're going to have this wonderful life, and all this great stuff. Now, he says, I'm trying to tell when you're going to die. <laughs> There's a total reversal going on. And we asked our biologists in some sense for doing this because now we'd like to know what is it that's going to kill off the Earth or the end of the world or some aspect. So maybe we should take a minute and think about what is the end of the world. Well, being a middle-aged basketball player last week, I went into my doctor because my leg was blown up like the Hindenburg. And he said, well, you've torn a muscle in your leg. And I said, I couldn't do that. And he said, yes, you could. I said, no. And I said, why? He said, we're getting old. He said, no, I'm not. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. <laughs> You're 52 years old. You can't play basketball anymore. And that became an end of my life, the end of the world for me, one end of the world. And I began thinking, what are the ends of the world? Is it the end of our life, civilization, our species, all animal life, all life, the planet itself? And the aspect that we'd like to put forth tonight is that there are many ends to the world. And the way we try to figure this out in this rather messy slide is that we have measurable aspects of our planet. 
As Don has shown, we can measure solar luminosity, temperatures. We can measure aspects of the atmosphere, such as the amount of carbon dioxide. But we can also measure aspects of life. And one of the most important is in the green box, global biological productivity. It's affected by many things. This is a messy diagram, because just as we as organisms are very complex, so too is our planet an extremely complex system. We would like to try to model when various aspects of these boxes start changing and do so in ways that we consider as part of the ends of the world. And so what I want to first think about is this one, productivity, the green box. Productivity is the rate at which inorganic carbon is fixed and turned into organic carbon. It's really a measure of the rate at which life takes the inorganic and makes itself into more life. We can't measure this directly from the past, but we have proxies. We have ways of examining perhaps how much productivity there was in the past. And from that last box model, a number of very clever people have come together and arrived at a rough sense of the productivity of our planet. And what we find interesting is that for the first time, it looks as if productivity peaked perhaps 500 million years ago, about the time the first animals arose in the oceans. And it's been dropping since. And this is nothing like we expected. And the unexpected nature of this comes from some very interesting evolutionary aspects. About the time that Darwin was writing his great treatise, another man named John Phillips was putting this diagram together. This is the first estimate of biological, not productivity, but diversity. And diversity is the number of species on the planet. This is about 150 years old, this diagram. It is an indication of the rise of animal life at the Cambrian. He didn't know at the time in 1860 when this diagram was made. But the fact that we have this explosion of animals, a big crash, a second great diversification and a crash, and a third allowed John Phillips to define these well now well-known terms of Paleozoic life, Mesozoic life, and Cenozoic life. But another aspect less well understood at the time, but I think extremely interesting, is that if you smooth this curve off, we find that it keeps growing to the point that there's more diversity, more species on the planet now than any time in the past, if we are to believe this diagram, which is based on the fossil record. Well, this flies in the face of the productivity findings, or perhaps it suggests that productivity and diversity are decoupled. Today, our modern-day diversity curves look like this. This is from Jack Sapkowski and work done at the University of Chicago over the last 20 years. And again, we see John Phillips' diagram now, but with much more data. And we see that we have more species, many more species, in the present day. But do we? Over the last two or three years, a new examination of this suggests that perhaps this isn't the case. Perhaps we are no longer, as a planet with animals, the teenager who is growing into an ever larger body. But we are rather like the middle-aged man or woman who is now looking at reductions of things, reductions of bad things. And the new diversity curve suggests this may simply be an artifact of the fossil record. We have indications that productivity is dropping and that perhaps the number of species on the planet will soon be dropping. If we think about the ends of the world, then, let's come up with a chronology briefly. And the first that we'd like to think about doesn't deal with life so much, but will definitely affect life. It will be the end of the interglacial. Then there will be an end of plant life, followed by an end of animals, the loss of the oceans, the end of all life on Earth, and I'll briefly look at some of these. As Don mentioned, 15,000 years ago, Seattle was a place of ice, but there was enough land nearby that were we to go out, we would probably run into one of these because we find their skeletons coming out after every rainy season. In Squim alone, the tusks come out with great regularity, the great mammoths and mastodons. But there are some very disturbing data. This is a messy slide, but this is the part I want to think about. This is from one of the ice cores that have been brought out. It's a temperature record through time in the age here in hundreds of thousands of years. And we're looking at the present here and the past through here. And what we see is low temperature and then a nice spike. And then a long low temperature and then a nice spike. These are the interglacials. And this is where we are today. And these are what are in between, the glacial periods. Because it turns out our Earth, over a very long period of time now, more than a million years, has had 90,000 years of very cold and ice and 10,000 years of warm. And we are in that warm right now. And I submit to you that the first and one of the most nasty ends of the Earth that we're going to see 
is the end of this interglacial. I'm so politically incorrect because I'm going, global warming, global warming, keep going. <laughs> and here's why. This is by, and the arc that I'm about to show is from my great friend Alexis Rockman, who's the co-author of my most recent book, which I won't use here because that'd be a commercial plug. It's not Millstone Coffee. <laughs> and he's drawn New York City in Central Park, where we finish our global warming. And this is what happens. When the glaciers come back, the human population will no longer be able to sustain 6 billion people. Perhaps we can't sustain 6 billion just as it is. But certainly when we start covering huge portions of the planet with glaciers, Six billion is no good, and they are coming back. We may have a million, maybe two more million years of this 90,000 ice, 10,000 interglacial. The first and greatest and nastiest end of the world will be this, when the ice comes back. And then the carbon dioxide kicks in, and it keeps dropping and dropping and dropping. And the consequence of plate tectonics and the enlarging sun is, as Don has shown this, and eventually we get to the loss of all plants at 10 ppm, and to think that this is some airy fairy off in the future, we only have to look at the plants on the globe today. We have two major types. Most and ancient plants are called C3 plants. But there's a second type that most recently evolved, perhaps only 15 million years ago, and has really come into consequence in the last several million years, called a C4 plant. It is a plant adapted to lowering CO2. Evolution is driving its engines to produce plants to deal with this dropping CO2 crisis. And these will be the plants of the future. And they are not the trees that we know. They're mostly grasses. We see a world where the trees drop away. We see a whole new type of world coming at us. The food chains will be drastically different, as Don has said. Animals are going to get to eat animals and bacteria. You can see some of this in your houses, at least in my house in Seattle. All those spiders in the winter, they grow and they crawl all over. They get in your bathtub and they can't get out. And other spiders get in there, and they can't get out, and they start eating each other. There's no plants there. This is a totally carnivorous food chain. <laughs> and then what they do get to eat, if you're a herbivore, is you get to eat bacteria burgers. Mmm, more E. coli. <laughs> That's the other fate. We lose our plants. We can either eat animals or bacteria or fungi. But it's not the type of world that we know. It is the end of the world as we know it. So here's a view now. Productivity has dropped again from Alexis Rothman. Let's look in the future. And what we have is the age of humans left here in the strata and a few weeds left over. But this becomes the world. It's not just lowered species. It's lowered productivity. Lowered productivity means there is less life. We are on a planet with less life. And the life that you see, much of it's bacteria. So let's get to the age of animals and how that comes to an end. We have lost our plants now. Animals can survive in a plant-free world, but what animals can't do right now is survive in a world over about 50 degrees centigrade. And so as this plant-free world commences, we should expect this cornucopia of new evolution, all types of new animals appearing on the stage and rapidly disappearing. Because what's happening now is when heat starts going up, it does so very, very, very fast. This is a temperature graph in the present and somewhere around 1 billion years in the future, or perhaps less, this starts its upward climb. And the upward climb is very, very rapid, such that we finally get to a lethal upper temperature for animals, and finally, a loss of oceans themselves. Here are the data that lets us look at this. Fish and mammals and insects, all about 50 degrees centigrade. Crustaceans, vascular plants, a little less. The smaller stuff, the protozoans, the algae, and the fungi does a little better. But it's the bacteria that will be the final members of life on this planet once we start this runaway temperature phenomenon. So this gives a sense of the concept of what we call devolution. We've been in this evolution for a long time. Just as when we're growing teenagers, it's anabolism. And then there's this turnover, and it turns into catabolism, the downhill slide. We're writing a book about this. We ought to sell two copies <laughs> to each other. <laughs> Don made this slide. It's wonderful. This is the tree of life. This is, comes from work on ribosomal RNA, in which we compare various groups. And we know there's three major groupings 
of life on this tree. And the tree you can think of as a big plant sticking up at you and its trunk goes down out of the screen. There's bacteria, archaea, and eukarya, and we are here right at the end of this. And we might expect that the tree of life, which has been blossoming and growing in this new world where diversity is dropping and this new world where productivity is dropping, is itself going to be pruned. And that pruning now gets to not a great tree, but a tree like the trees I grow in my house, which are half dead and then three quarters dead. And you keep lopping off those dead branches. My orange tree does this. So we are here now somewhere in the not so distant future. And then finally it ends up, we were here. And the tree of life is now kind of a little moss of life or a nasty little shrub of life because devolution has been reducing this downward and downward and downward. So what will it be like at the very end? And here's a view from Alexis, again, of what he thought the end of the world might be like. And he asked me when we did these paintings, we did them together. So I thought, well, you got some armadillo-like creatures, you got some tough plants, and you got some tough beetles, and a huge sun. The sky's going to look different. Everything's going to be different. It's not Seattle. It's not the world as we know it. But we're optimistic people, we are, and so we put this human footprint here walking off into the sunset, if you will. And we do this for a very good reason. The last creatures on the planet are probably going to look like this, but there has never been a creature on the planet such as ourselves. Now, we all have the sense for the survival of Homo sapiens. You talk to anyone, perhaps yourself, you've thought this. Gee, we're not going to last much longer. When I read the news every day, it's so depressing and it's so awful, and the year has been so terrible, as we know that perhaps there's this guilt and fear reflex, we should go extinct. Maybe be better, better for the planet, but I don't think that's going to happen. The average mammal species lasts about 5 million years. We've been around 200,000. We've got 4,800,000 years <laughs> left at a minimum. If we're average, then we're not average. <laughs> but secondly, what happens if it isn't this orderly old age that gets this? How about an accident? I might walk out of here and be hit by a bus. Well, there's not too many buses this time of night. I've tried. Nevertheless, you know the concept. So the accidental ways, comet and asteroids, supernova, other mass extinctions, or human cause, perhaps we could do it. And very briefly, let's look at the stuff that could do us in that isn't the old age end of the world. Comets can do it. We certainly have craters on this planet. We certainly know that in the past, the impact of great asteroids with the Earth, especially that of 65 million years ago, resets the evolutionary agenda. Up till 65 million years ago, this was us, reptilian food. Talk about food chain, and we weren't any bigger than this. And it was the disappearance of the dinosaurs with this asteroid impact of 65 million years ago that allowed us mammals to diversify and take off. These chance events do change the river course of life. They do change evolutionary history. And the Chicxulub asteroid coming in took out a world and let another world in its place. But it turns out that had that asteroid been bigger, were we hit several years ago by Hale-Bopp, our story would be over. There are a lot of studies now based on crater diameter and estimates of the kill. We call this a kill curve from one of my mentors, David Raup. And many of us now at the University of Washington, and part of our astrobiology grant is to quantify the kill curve. I go every year to the most god-awful place in the world, the northern part of the Queen Charlotte's, where it never stops raining, because we're chasing craters, and we're looking at putting points on these curves to understand what is the accident rate, what is the future of civilization on our planet. Because if one of these comes in, civilization is over. It's the end of the world. But there's other stuff, supernova. Turns out that there are exploding stars, and any one of these going off within 30 light years of us can probably do us in. 30 light years is a long way away, but it's not so far away that you're not hit by material that'll take your ozone layer away. And supernovas are another way that the world could come to an end. But my most favorite end of the world, and perhaps the scenario where it ends soonest, unfortunately, is from something we can do with plate tectonics. And here's one more way to look at the future now. We can predict the directions of continents to some extent. And Chris Scotes, who came up with these, his Paleomap project, has for years in Britain been looking at the subduction zones and the seafloor spreading on the modern-day planet to predict 
where continents are going. And here's his map of 50 million years in the future. We have a gigantic mountain chain where the Mediterranean used to be. India is further up. Australia has crashed into New Guinea. We have changes. Antarctica has moved. And if we continue these vectors and look even further, what we see is this, 250 million years in the future, long before CO2 has dropped, long before the oceans have gone away, long before temperature has changed to the point that animals are on their way out, we may yet have the death of the world. Because 250 million years ago, the continents were in the same configuration. We can look at future world here and compare it to the late Permian 255 million years ago. When all the continents were together, Gondwana land merged with North America in a giant supercontinent called Pangaea. And one of the aspects of our research at the University of Washington is to try to understand why it is that that continental configuration, which is facing us again, led to the single greatest mass extinction in the history of the planet. The reason there is a Paleozoic era and a Mesozoic era is that 250 million years ago, 90% of all life on the planet came to a very sudden end. Recently, it's been thought perhaps this is an asteroid, but now much new research, some of it from brother Roger Buick, my close new colleague at the University of Washington, some from my own work, has shown that there were a series of crises, and they appear to be related to the continental configuration itself. And so much of this work is done in South Africa, this slide is for me, it's irony for me, there's four Boer family members who all died within about six years at about the year 1900. This is in the middle of the South African desert. And right behind them is what we call the Permal Triassic Boundary, where this great mass extinction is perhaps best shown. I've tried to track down what killed this family. You can't do it. You go to the records and you can't find out. A hundred years old, and we can't figure out what killed an entire family in a very short period of time. And yet I sit here and try to understand what happened 250 million years ago. This is to give me the sense of humility I need. But the clues are interesting. And the interesting aspect is that the fossil record tells us that whatever wiped out the world then was sudden and quick and non-asteroidal. And it's the fossil record that tells us this. So here we see a whole fauna that we don't see in Spielberg movies, that has no popular place in popular culture the biggest carnivore at the time, the biggest herbivore menacing my son Patrick. <laughs> child abuse, 250 million year old monsters menacing your child. And Alexis, a view of what happened, because what we think has happened is that that continental configuration brought about changes in climate that led to a world, a desert world, a great global heating. A few things get through. This is a nasty picture, but it is your ancestor. This species does get through that particular mass extinction. And because of that, we have a human history. One species makes it through. And this is our deepest ancestor in the oldest Triassic rocks. This is a pen for scale, really tiny. Gaze ye upon your deep ancestor. So the end of the world, in many respects, will be this. Because when all that is said and done, when it's all gone, this is what will be left. This is Washington State residents from Hanford deep down in the rocks, bacteria. And this will be the last survivors of the planet that we know of. Don is right, I think. We live in a great moment in history, and I think we should revere it and enjoy it, because the future looks pretty grim. Well, you might say, well, what's it got to do with me? That's a long way in the future. But we might close with a couple of remarks about the future. Don? Well, there are many ends of the Earth, uh, but there also is an end of the Earth an astronomical end. The sun slowly gets brighter. That uh, curve I showed earlier of the brightness of the sun showed over you know, a dozen billion years that it increased in brightness by a factor of about two and a half. Then it becomes a star, a red giant, like Betelgeuse, famous uh, red giant star because of the movie. And this is a plot of what the sun will look like uh, after 12 billion years, which is afternoon on that clock that went from 0 to 12. And so this is a highly uh, expanded scale here. There's only uh, a few hundred million years in time in here. But the sun, in terms of increasing brightness of you know, tens of percent, look at these numbers. This is sun's brightness relative to now, 10, 100,000. It actually becomes 6,000 times brighter 
And there's fabulous stuff in here from astronomy that's really quite interesting. Uh, some very interesting physics that goes on. This is the helium flash. And this uh, expanded version over here, just a half a million years, where it goes these pulses. Uh, but its effects on the Earth are spectacular. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> the sun, when it's a red giant, uh, becomes thousands of times brighter, but it also expands out to enormous size. It actually engulfs Mercury and Venus, and the Earth is actually just on the edge. And the current estimate is that the Earth actually will go into the sun at this time. Mars will definitely not, and everything beyond that uh, will. So that Mars, so uh, in spite of all the things that people have done, you know, to save the Earth, uh, eating uh, hamburgers at Planet Hollywood or whatever you were to, did to save the Earth, uh, didn't work. Unfortunately, the, the grim aspect of why we should enjoy things now, because everything you know, we work for, our legacy, uh, except for spacecraft that we send off somewhere else, everything on the Earth will end up most likely inside the sun during this red giant phase. These are some pictures uh, from Bruce Ballack, uh, the chair of our department. He took with the Hubble Space Telescope. It's called the Planetary Nebula. It's a picture of the star and its latest uh, final ages. So the Earth may be going in this time, but it goes with a real bang. So I said, you know, the, uh, the good, <laughs> bad, and ugly. It's really ugly, but it's also actually beautiful. So uh, this is the sun exploding, and we were here. Uh, you know, we are gone, and Venus is gone, and Mercury is gone. Mars is still there, Jupiter and Saturn are there. And the sun uh, becomes fainter with time. It becomes a, a white dwarf star about the size of the Earth, uh, about the brightness of the moon. It actually lasts for a very, very long time. Uh, but the solar system is no longer uh, what it was. Now, so that's kind of a bad story. But this is, we talked about nature's way. This is the way nature works. Things form, they blossom, they go away. And you always like to have some sort of happy ending into any kind of story. Well, there is no real happy ending, but we actually came from something like this. I, I mentioned the little peak called triple alpha in, in, in earlier in the talk. That's how carbon is produced. This stuff flying out of this exploding star contains carbon. The carbon in our bodies was made by this process. So this is a refreshing in a, in a sort. You wouldn't be happy to be there participating in it. But nonetheless, uh, this is the way the universe works. So this is our past uh, and our future. Peter, we'll wrap it up. Well, I guess the only way to wrap up, if Time magazines could tell us how it's going to end, I guess that's the truth. <laughs> My own point of view is that the message I want to take away, I don't know what you're going to take away, but I know what I'm going to take away from this talk, is that we're not dead yet. But unfortunately, a lot of other stuff is. And if we're going to talk about the tree of life, here's another tree. This is the tree of death. And this is from all the species that we have taken out, we humans, in a very short time. And that I see us now as custodians of this planet. And if the planet is going to last 100 million years, or 200 million, or 500 million, we can't worry about that. What we need to worry about are our generations, our families, and the animals that we have somehow been given control over. Uh, personally, I may be a middle-aged basketball player, but that doctor can't tell me to stop playing. And I would like to finish up by thanking you for coming, and also thanking this university for having me, I'm a graduate, an undergraduate from here, but certainly giving me the opportunity to the work I've been able to do I've traveled all over this world, and I have no of no better place to be. Thank you. How about some questions? <laughs> yes, please. You, you sort of put the, the end of maybe human or mammalian life at 45 degrees C is a rough number. Actually, it's interesting. My friend in Bari, Italy, recently emailed me and said, today it's 45 degrees C. Um, and life went on. But in any event, with the... <laughs> with, but it wasn't happy. With, 
<clears throat> in Bari, Italy, it's always. Wasn't year after year either. <laughs> with, with, with the uh, you know um, advent of uh, increased numbers of SUVs, I think our temperature is likely to keep on going up uh, on this planet. And um, well, why, why, given a, a reasonable length of time, why won't we evolve to have thicker skins that will pre prevent us from UV exposure, having uh, mechanisms to, to dump off waste heat? Uh, it seems like there's plenty of re readily easy mechanisms that, that m mammals, for example, could, could continue to evolve to deal with, with planetary temperatures up to 100 or, or more degrees C. Well, there's a possibility. Certainly, we know that bacteria can live at 113 degrees centigrade. And you can always say, how can we say that large, complex life can't also take those adaptations? And of course, we can't say that. But on the other hand, mitochondria in animals and plants just quit working at about 50 degrees centigrade. And just the complexity of larger organisms seems to just stop at those. It's like a magic temperature barrier. We're not going to sit here and say that life will not find a way. In Jurassic Park it did. Certainly on this future planet it might. But nevertheless, there's a, a, a other good scientific reasons to suggest that that will be a barrier. Just as Don and I don't think we'll colonize the nearest stars, animals may never figure out. They never did figure out how to live in no oxygen. And there's plenty of those environments. It never happened. And they may never learn how to even get to 70 degrees centigrade. But you're, you're, you have a very valid point. Yeah, and also uh, people, I mean, you know, we live in submarines un under the ocean in a very cold places. I mean, in all our lives, we, we modify our environment to be nicer uh, for us. So you can imagine some small subset of humans on this planet living in refrigerated conditions. There's no problem at all living in the 150 degrees centigrade conditions as long as you've got enough power and food and, 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 and cooling, but not a planet with billions of people. So the one message to take away now is buy air conditioner stock. <laughs> <laughs> Now the glaciers are coming. Or fans. Well, the glaciers are coming. A lot of fans. <laughs> Thank you. Okay.